Alright guys, how's it going? Once again, it's been a while since my last video. I've been working on this one for a very long time, and I was in Scotland for a week as well. And while I was over there, Nvidia had announced their third quarter financial results, and they were staggering. They made a massive amount of money on the back of gaming GPU sales, the kind of money that we have never seen them make before. Now, a lot of financial guys follow me, and I just thought I would do a video on this, but as time went by, I started looking deeper and deeper into the whole situation. And the further back I went, the more interesting things became. Most of you are going to learn something really interesting here. So we're going to start way back in 2008. Now, I will probably do a full history video one day, but for the purposes of this one, all we really need to know is that, historically, ATI and Nvidia traded blows in a GPU battle where one or the other normally held a quite commanding lead. In the run up to 2008, Nvidia had held the lead for around 3 years with their G80 and G92 chips, which we can actually see mentioned here in this Anantec article. I'm going to use Anantec a lot in this video because back in these days, Anantec was the go-to site for graphics card reviews. So we're in the middle of 2008 and Nvidia had just launched their GT200, better known as the GTX 280 and 260. It was massive. It was an absolutely massive GPU, as you can see here compared to a dual core Intel CPU. Now if we scroll down we can see that the GTX 280 had 240 stream processors compared to 192 of the GTX 260. So that's 25% more. So this was quite a heavily cut down GPU. Maybe not surprising because of the size of the GPU. I talk about die sizes a lot because it's very important from an economical standpoint. The bigger your GPU, the harder it is to manufacture. So the GTX 280 would be this full massive GPU whereas the GTX 260 would effectively have a quarter of the die fused off in order to improve yields. Looking at the prices though, $650 for the GTX 280 and $400 for the GTX 260. Now AMD had recently bought ATI and were integrating ATI into their own company. And the rumours suggested that AMD had basically quit trying to compete against Nvidia's massive GPUs. They had given up on the high end and instead would try what they called the sweet spot strategy. This resulted in a GPU called RV770, which was less than half the size of the GTX 280. RV770 is better known as the HD4870 and the HD4850. We can see here though, it is less than half the size. You can probably figure out that the bigger the GPU, the faster it is. It's got way more transistors, and this should have been an easy victory for Nvidia. That's not what happened. So these are Anantec's numbers, seven of the biggest games back then, and a bunch of easily recognisable classics. As usual, the green bars are the Nvidia cards, and the red bars are AMD cards. And straight away we can see that the GTX 280 does win most of the games. In fact, it only loses in Bioshock, which was a nice win for the 4870. It makes up for that though with a big win in the older Oblivion game. What's really interesting here though is the 4870's performance against the GTX 260, where it wins all of them again apart from Oblivion. Over those 7 games, the GTX 280 was only 4.7% faster than the HD4870. The HD4870 was 17.3% faster than the GTX 260, and the GTX 260 was only 6.4% faster than the HD4850. Now here's a list of some of the important stats on these graphics cards. Again we can see that the GTX 260, which I have labelled GTX 260 192, has 192 cores. It also has a smaller memory bus and less VRAM compared to the 280. Again the chip is GT200 and it was built on a 65 nanometer node. Now if you look over to the right we can see that the AMD cards were actually built on a 55 nanometer node. So that was a more advanced node. And this is what ATI and AMD normally did. They were always first to the new node. Or in this case what they call a half node. 55 nanometers is a half node of 65 nanometers. This would normally mean that you get slightly smaller die sizes and save a little bit of power. In this case though we can see that it is half the size. The HD4870 also had GDDR5 compared to GDDR3 of the rest of the cards. So this was another first for AMD. 
Effectively, what we're looking at is a much more advanced GPU, and that allowed AMD to get much closer to the GTX 280 than they really should have been. What really matters here is the very bottom column, the prices. HD4870 launched at $299, and the 4850 was $199. So AMD had created a card which almost matched the GTX 280 at less than half the cost, easily beat the GTX 260 at $100 less, and even the 4850 almost matched the GTX 260 at half the price. Clearly, two of these cards are well worth buying, and the other two not so much. Now, Nvidia figured this out pretty quickly, and less than a month later, were forced to slash the prices of the GTX 280 and the 260. The 280 was dropped down to $500, which in my book still makes it a very poor buy, and the GTX 260 was dropped down to the same price as the HD 4870, which in my book is still a bad buy. It clearly lost, yet it was still the same price. A bit later on in the year, they realised that this still wasn't enough, and they released a GTX 260 Core 216. Rather than the 192 cores, they were forced to release a 216 core version, which was more able to compete with the 4870. Hopefully you're picking up a lesson here about the value of having competition. Nvidia could have released this card to start with. The GTX 260 Core 216 should have been what they released to start with, but they chose to release a much more cut down card because they didn't believe AMD would be competitive enough. AMD's response could hardly have been simpler. They simply stuck another half gigabyte of VRAM onto the 4870, and they were now basically tied with the GTX 280. It was all rather simple for Anand Tech as well. The bottom line, the HD 4870 one gigabyte was the card to get. Now, like I said, only two of those cards appeared to be worth buying, and checking out the Steam hardware survey for November 2008, which is a few months after all of the four cards have been on sale, this is using the Wayback Machine, which is a really great resource for finding historical web pages. Now, if we scroll down to DX10 GPUs, we can see that the GeForce 8800 is still way at the top, 27%. That card sold by the millions. I had one, it was a great card, obviously. But as you might expect, the HD 4800 series, which is the 4870 and the 4850, had already climbed up to 6.53%, a bit further below the GTX 260 at 1.48%, and a little below that is the GTX 280 at 1.22%. So overall, that's only 2.7% for the NVIDIA cards and 6.53% for the AMD cards. So that's almost three times the sales for the AMD cards. But that's just a few months. Maybe in a year's time, things will be a bit different. So let's check it a year forward. So September 2009, we're gonna scroll down again, click on DX10 GPUs. We can see that the 8800 is still hanging in there at 14%, but now the HD 4800 series is up to 11.5%. We've got the GTX 260 at 4%, and the GTX 280 is languishing away down at 1.34%. Judging by this, it would appear that AMD has managed to outsell Nvidia by around about 2 to 1. Now this must be reflecting in the financial statements as well. Now checking Nvidia's quarter 3 of 2009, we can see the GPU revenue. Now GPU in this case is almost all GeForce graphics, so gaming graphics cards. In the 3 months previous to this, Nvidia had made $465 million, but looking at AMD's third quarter of 2009, they had only made $306 million, a tiny profit of $8 million. And if you look along this, we can see that the numbers are very small indeed. The three months previous to this, AMD actually lost $12 million in their graphics department on what is actually pretty small revenue. Even more telling though, if you look at the nine months ending September 26, 2009, which basically should have been revenue of the entire 4800 series, they only made $779 million with a loss of $3 million. Now here's the thing, AMD's graphics department is their gaming graphics and their pro graphics. Basically anything to do with graphics, they were still losing money. Looking at Nvidia's GPU, they had made almost $1.2 billion in revenue in what is mostly gaming graphics. Nvidia continued to make more money on consumer GPU. 50% more revenue for Nvidia's GPU business, selling what was effectively worse graphics cards. 
These steam numbers didn't appear to be adding up, and we'll soon figure out what that was all about. But right now we're going to stay in September 2009, because in that month AMD had launched the Radeon HD 5870, which is obviously the successor to the 4870. One week later they launched the 5850. Nvidia's fastest graphics card at this time was the GTX 285. When I say the fastest graphics card, that's not quite accurate, as they did of course have the GTX 295, but that was a dual GPU card, and I'm not really talking about these here. So the fastest card Nvidia had was the GTX 285, which was finally built on the 55 nanometer node, the same as the old HD4870, and we can see here that it had a die size of 470 square millimeters, which is really quite large considering the die shrink from 65 to 55 nanometers only saved them 106 square millimeters. Now that is actually quite a big drop, but it was still a huge GPU compared to the HD4870. But anyway, this was called GT200B, but really it was just a GTX 280 on the new node with a bit of an overclock. The 5870 and 5850 were based on AMD's new Cypress GPU, both cards using GDDR5, and launch prices of $379 and $259, while the GTX 285 had launched at $400. You can probably figure how this is going to end, but let's look at the benchmarks. Right, so here we go. Immediately we can see that the HD 5870 and HD 5850 are clearly faster than the GTX 285. By around 25 and 8% respectively, the GTX 285 was the fastest card before this, faster than both the GTX 275 and the HD 4890, which again were more just like updates on the older GTX 260 and the HD 4870. But Nvidia had held the lead for around 9 months with this card, but then lost the lead to the HD5870 for around 6 months. Now the reason I'm showing this is, a lot of people say that people waited on Fermi, and it's true, Nvidia really stretched that one out. They were nowhere. They had lots of trouble with their Fermi architecture, they simply couldn't get it out. And it was 6 months later when they finally launched their GTX 480 graphics card. Once again over at Anantec, Nvidia's GeForce GTX 480 and GTX 470. Six months late, was it worth the wait? Once again another enormous GPU. And Nvidia was now on 40 nanometers, the same as the HD 5870 and HD 5850. Launch prices of $500 and $350 and the conclusion was, was it worth the wait? No, probably not. Anantec claimed 15% faster than the HD 5870. And here are the results of all the benchmarks. By my reckoning, the GTX 480 was actually only 9.2% faster than the HD 5870. The HD 5870 was 13.4% faster than the GTX 470, which was only 3.2% faster than the HD 5850. We can see here that it really is quite dependent on the title, with the Nvidia cards doing really well in Hawks while the AMD cards did pretty well in Left 4 Dead and Bad Company 2. But yeah, six months later for that, no, it simply wasn't worth the wait. But what was really starting to show here was AMD's massive technological lead. It actually started way back with the RV670, which was better known as the HD3870. Very, very small GPU, which wasn't actually that much slower than Nvidia's G80 and G92. Then it continued with RV770, with the HD4870 which almost was able to beat the massive GT200. With Cypress, that is the HD5870, the AMD chips were starting to get bigger, and once again it took a massive, and effectively a very highly overclocked graphics card. That's why Fermi was so bad in terms of power. Nvidia had to push that card to its limit in order to just beat the HD 5870. These die sizes tell the story of AMD's technological leadership without a doubt, but this is business and what matters is making money. So checking out the Steam hardware survey for November 2010, so that is one year after the HD 5870 and six months after the GTX 480 were both launched. Scrolling down to the video card description, now we can see the HD 4800 series is now at the top, with the 8800 and 9800 finally relinquishing the top spot to those cards. And here we can see the HD 5700 and the HD 5800 series. We have to scroll down all the way to the bottom to find the GTX 480. 
a very long way behind. But again, that is only six months of sales compared to a whole year's sales of the 5800 and 5700 series cards. But something else caught my eye here, and it was the GeForce GTX 260 sandwiched in between these cards. But I'll get to that in a minute, because like I said, it's all about making money. And looking at AMD's financials for the third quarter of 2010, we can see that on a rather small net revenue of $390 million, AMD only made $1 million profit on all of their graphics sales. All of these sales of the 5800, 5700 series cards and everything else, and they could only muster $1 million of profit. But if we look at the nine months previous to this, we can see that they have in fact made $81 million in profit. It's not an awful lot, but at least it's good to see that they were getting some kind of reward for their clear leadership. But once again, when you look at Nvidia's numbers, we can see that Nvidia continued to make even more money. $582 million against $390 million. And in this quarter, they made $49 million in profit compared to AMD's $1 million. Looking over the nine months, their revenue was much higher, but they were in fact in the red over that nine months. This could be anything, I'm not entirely sure. It could have been paying a fine for something or something like that, I just don't know. But what matters is that Nvidia continued to make more money even when they were a mile behind. Once again, these Steam numbers don't really appear to be adding up. And seeing this GeForce GTX 260 sitting here helped me to realise what was going on. So I decided to fast forward another few months to February of 2011. Now by this stage, Steam had split the 4850 and the 4870, so no longer under one heading as the 4800 series, we could now see the proper split of these cards. And we can also see that the GTX 260 is ahead of them. Now you may think, well this is simple, people are upgrading their 4850s and 4870s to the 5850s and 5870s, but if that were the case, then these final numbers, which shows the change from month to month, would have been much higher. If you look at the GTX 260 for example, that card was still gaining more than any other card at the beginning of 2011. It was almost three years ago when the GTX 260 was released. People were no longer buying this card. It probably wasn't even available at that point. Yet that's not what Steam Hardware Survey shows. In the end, I figured it out. This could only actually be one thing. Remember back in the third quarter of 2009, when Nvidia had made $465 million, yet AMD had only made $306 million? It all now makes sense. Nvidia sold more GTX 260s than AMD sold either 4850s or 4870s. These cards were launched at the same time and AMD gave us the choice of paying half the cost for slightly less performance, that's the 4850, or more performance at around the same cost. And yet more people chose the GTX 260 anyway. But wait a minute, you might be thinking. Way back in September 2009, roughly three months after all these cards were released, AMD had a massive lead. They held 11.5% of the market with their 4800 series, while the GTX 260 was down at 4.18%. Now, even if you just split these two numbers, both of these cards should be outselling the GTX 260, but they weren't. What we are seeing here is enthusiasts, real graphics and gaming enthusiasts buying the HD 4800s because they knew that it was the better buy. There's still a lot of GTX 260s being sold, to be frank, a bit more than Nvidia deserved. But the real story was, Nvidia had sold more GTX 260s. There were an awful lot less people on Steam on September 2009. If I look at my own Steam profile, I can see that I joined on the 4th of March 2009, just over 7 years ago. My assumption would be that most of you are the same or had joined Steam much more recently. In my case, I was playing Warcraft. I really wasn't playing anything else and I didn't have to join Steam until I was basically forced to do so, probably with one of the Civilization games. But back in 2009, there were many more enthusiasts on Steam and that's why the AMD cards showed up better compared to three years later where the Steam numbers had probably tripled and we start to see a lot more average gamers rather than enthusiasts. And these are the people who bought the GTX 260 en masse. And these are the people who continue to buy Nvidia, basically no matter what. 
Now, there was nothing wrong with the GTX 260, especially not the Core 216 version. It was fine, it reasonably competed with the 4870, it was just worse, and it shouldn't have sold more, but it did. And in the end, this simply meant that AMD made less money than they deserved to make, but it just got worse over time. While the GTX 260 was a decent card, Nvidia continued to outsell AMD with cards that really didn't deserve to sell well. For example, cards like the GTX 550 Ti. March the 15th, 2011, Nvidia had finally fixed Fermi. The 400 series had become the 500 series, which had basically fixed Fermi's power draw. The Anantec article, GTX 550 Ti, coming up short at $150. Now let's look at the context before we have a look at the benchmarks. You basically had a choice of two competing AMD cards here. You could have taken the much older HD5770, which was released at the same time as the 5870 and 5850 way back in October 2009, or you could have the much more recent HD6850, which was released in October 2010. These cards had been on the market way before the GTX 550 Ti appeared in March 2011. Looking at the die sizes again, the HD5770 is basically in a lower class. The 550Ti and the 6850 are basically in the same class. 255 square millimeters, 238 square millimeters. These cards should have been competing against each other. And looking at the prices, the 550Ti was only $10 cheaper. That was against the launch price of the 5770 which was almost certainly much cheaper at this stage. Or you could pay another $30 for the HD 6850 and see what that gets. That extra $30 would get you massively more performance in every game, as the 6850 was in fact in a completely different class of performance. The 550 Ti basically matched the HD 5770 18 months later with a much bigger die size. What's more, the 550Ti used even more power than both the 6850 and the 5770. It's pretty clear to see why this card did come up short. Roll on 18 months, and there is the 550Ti sitting proudly in third place in the Steam hardware survey. All the numbers are down a bit because Intel's HD graphics got added to the totals. But we can clearly see that, in terms of discrete desktop GPUs, the GTX 550Ti was the number two selling graphics card at this time. Who was buying these graphics cards? It wasn't enthusiasts. If you wanted this level of performance, you could have had it 18 months previously with the 5770 at roughly half the power and the same cost. Who waited to buy this 550Ti? The answer is really simple. It is the average graphics card buyer. No idea how this card performs, but it's an Nvidia card at a certain price point and that's why it's sold by the millions. This 560 Ti, very popular card, and it also sold by the millions. The 560 Ti launched at the end of January 2011, some 14 months after the HD 5870 had launched. And going through Anantec's bench, we can see that it is pretty much a wash. 5870 wins some, the 560 Ti wins some, there's not an awful lot in it. Power consumption was around the same, the die sizes were around the same. In technical terms, Nvidia had matched the 5870 finally 14 months later, and the press lost their minds over this card. Xbit Laboratories, Nvidia GeForce GTX 560 Ti, the hero of our times, and the Steam numbers showed the massive sales of this card. The same level of performance that you could have had one year previously. Now, it is true that the 5870 was a more expensive card at launch, but by this time, I mean, we are talking 14 months later, you could get this card for $220, around the same time that the 560 Ti was launching at $250. But by this stage, the 560 Ti was massively outselling the 5870. But hopefully my point here is clear enough. No matter where you look through the product stack, you would see Nvidia cards overwhelmingly outselling AMD cards. As time went on, AMD started losing their advantage. That's gonna happen when you starve a company of money. Money they should have had. But the masses continued to buy Nvidia without even looking to see what the red team had. You can talk about things like the halo effect. In many of these examples, the Nvidia card was actually faster. 
For example, the 280 was a tiny bit faster than the HD4870. And there are people out there who simply buy the fastest. A lot of you will be watching this, but can you truthfully say that you always buy the fastest? If so, did you own a 5870? Or did you jump straight from a 280 to a 480 or a 580? This is the way that most people buy GPUs. Now we're in the situation where there are more gamers than there were back in 2008. An awful lot more gamers and they overwhelmingly outnumber the enthusiasts. And the overwhelming number of these new gamers bought NVIDIA. And it has always been this way. I had bought three or four NVIDIA cards before I had even considered buying AMD, or at that time ATI. And this is pretty much how it is for the vast majority of graphics cards buyers. You start off buying NVIDIA, and then if you are really interested in the technology, you start looking at the benchmarks and maybe you can get a better deal, something like that. And when you look at it, it is very clear that over the years, AMD have offered far better value and hopefully now it's clear that they had a massive technology lead as well, one which has sadly been eroded over time due to a lack of money. And the problem we have now is Nvidia is now making so much money that they have a practically unassailable lead. The enthusiasts are still buying AMD. The reason I know this is that I pay a lot of attention to forums. And I read a lot of technology websites. Just after the GTX 1060 was released, Tech Power Up ran a poll asking if people would buy the GTX 1060 or the RX 480. The RX 480 got 40% of the vote, with the GTX 1060 only scoring 30%. This is not one or two people, yeah? 18,000 votes, 13,000 votes. This is thousands of people, thousands of enthusiasts who had made up their mind that the RX 480 was the smarter buy. For whatever reason, that's what the enthusiast market had decided. Now, I want to say something about this. A lot of people confuse enthusiast with money, but that's not actually the case. An enthusiast will buy the smart buy, the best value that they can get because they understand what they are buying. They understand the benchmarks. Maybe they understand the value of competition. But for whatever reason, enthusiasts had decided that the RX 480 was the card to get over the 1060. Looking at the Steam hardware survey today, October 2016, utterly dominated by NVIDIA graphics cards, the GTX 1070 is outselling the RX 480 by a lot. And this is one of the reasons why NVIDIA is making so much money. But here we have the GTX 1060 running at just under 1% of the entire market. And we need to scroll down a very long way until we find the RX 480 at roughly one quarter of the market. Even though the enthusiast voted 4 to 3 that the RX 480 was the better card, the 1060 is being bought at a rate of 4 to 1 in comparison. And there's only one word for it, it is mind share. Nvidia's mind share is absolutely massive and AMD simply cannot compete with it. It's not that they aren't trying. The Gaming Evolved logo is splashed all over the place now in games, especially in DX12. And there is another thing. It's well known that AMD performs better in DX12, but it's not stopping the sales of NVIDIA cards. Perhaps it's a fair comment to say that, well, AMD didn't even compete with the GTX 1070 and the GTX 1080. But the simple fact of the matter is, had they competed there, they would simply be losing more money. Back to this month's Steam hardware survey. A quick search for the 980 Ti shows that it has sold around about 1% of the market. Type Fury into this box and there is nothing there at all. Now that simply means that Fury is under 0.1% of the market. That's the Fury, the Fury Nano and the Fury X. In other words, the 980 Ti has massively outsold all of the Fury cards combined. Now you could say, well that's fair enough, the 980 Ti was the better card. And yeah, it was better than Fury X, but what about Fury? What about the Fury Nano? Guys buying graphics cards in this kind of price range are simply not buying AMD. And this is another issue. Because like I said, enthusiasts will buy the smart buy. Guys with a lot of money will simply spend a lot of money on Nvidia cards. And that is where the real money is made. Even with a quarter of the sales of the GTX 1070 and 1080, there's not enough money there to justify the cost of developing that GPU. This is why Vega is coming next year. This is why Nvidia, who used to be over a year behind, are now a year ahead. 
nothing to do with technical competence. It's all about the money. And I realized this when I found out that rather than competing in the high-end graphics arena on the new 16 nanometer process, rather than fighting it out with NVIDIA, fight they can never win. They instead decided to use the new 16 nanometer process to shrink the consoles. They're taking the guaranteed money rather than the guaranteed loss. Looking closer at the figures, it's just shocking in all honesty. Over those three years since the 4870 was launched, all the way through the 5 and 6 series, when Nvidia was struggling with Fermi, AMD only made $260 million in profit. Over those three years, that's consumer and professional GPU. While in the last three months alone, Nvidia made $678 million in profit from their gaming GPU business alone. Almost three times the money in three months compared to three years. That's the kind of odds AMD has always been up against and it can't go on any longer. I probably don't need to tell you just how bad this is for us, the PC gamers, and it is just gonna get worse because Nvidia has now got the taste of making a lot of money and they also realize that they will sell graphics cards no matter what because the vast majority of their buyers simply don't know what they're buying and I'm going to cover this topic in detail in a video coming soon. So grab yourself a barrel and get bent over it because we are about to be shafted. In the end, these enthusiast numbers simply are not enough to save AMD's graphics division. They have effectively been defeated by pure unadulterated mindshare. They're good enough for Apple, they're good enough for Sony, they're good enough for Microsoft, but they're not good enough for the PC master race. When you struggle to sell faster cards for cheaper compared to your competitor, the simple fact is, even when AMD won, they still lost. And in the long run, we are the ones that are going to pay for it. There is still the technical competence there, and we will see it again near the beginning of December. I can't go into details, but I will obviously be covering it in video. It's not Vega and it's not Zen, so don't get too excited. But you should hopefully see a few more videos from me in December. Just to wrap this one up, clearly it's been a massive video and it has taken a very long time. The simple fact of the matter is, this is just like a hobby to me, and I do feel driven to do as much as I can to try and save PC gaming from itself, but it looks like the battle is lost unless Zen delivers for AMD. They never stood a chance in discrete graphics. Nvidia's mindshare was always too strong, but the CPU market is different and Intel do not have the same kind of overwhelming mindshare. So pray to whatever God you believe in that Zen does indeed deliver. Oh yeah, one last thing. One of my viewers offered a couple of game keys to give away to a lucky winner. So if you want to win a copy of Star Wars Battlefront, simply leave a comment below and I'll pick a winner at random over the next couple of days. So thanks very much to Quinn for giving away those keys. I will be giving away a copy of Titanfall 2 in a later video. I'll catch you later. I'll catch you later.